Well, today we celebrate Gaudate Sunday, that Sunday that every priest dreads, because we always have to answer the question, Father, why are you wearing pink? Well, as you know, see, they found it funny. As you know, pink is not a liturgical color. Rose is, and this is the best dad joke, father joke of all time. We wear rose, not pink. Why? Because Jesus rose from the dead. He didn't pink from the dead. Horrible dad joke. I get it. But what better way to start our Gaudate season, our time where we are supposed to rejoice in God always than with a horrible dad joke? I mean, I don't think there's a better way to do it. But we hear in our readings this weekend a change of theme. The whole season of Advent is about preparation. It's about repentance. It's about patiently awaiting. Yet, there was none of that in our readings today. Now, we did hear again about John witnessing to who he is. He's that voice that cries out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, prepare ye the way of the Lord. But we also heard a lot about this thing that we struggle with. It's a little three-letter word called joy. As little kids, we learn where joy lives in our lives. Where is the joy? Down, 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 down in my heart, right? That's where it is. We keep it so hidden that we can't express how filled with joy we as Catholics, we as Christians are meant to be. Because we're taught as kids, if you're a joyful person, you're weird. We love it in infants. We, we love seeing babies smile. We love hearing a baby cackle. Ah, we love that. But then at some point, we learn cynicism. We learn that it's not good to be joy-filled because the world is against you. Life sucks and then you die. It's kind of the world, message of the world, isn't it? I mean, growing up, my spirit animal was grumpy of the seven dwarfs. Because for those of you who have known me long enough, you know that I am a giant amongst grovers, and we are dwarf people. We are all short, we are all small statured, we all got made fun of growing up for being so short, so you know what? If I'm going to be a dwarf, I'm going to claim it, and I'm going to be grumpy, and I'm going to be angry, and I'm going to look at the world the same way the world looks at me, in a pessimistic lens where you know what? I may not be perfect, but neither are you, so mm. Now, that's not the way we're supposed to live, right? I mean, that's not how we're supposed to embrace life. But as a kid, if the world treats you bad, you just throw that badness right back in its face, right? That's what we learn in the world. And so sometimes in life, just like the whole season of Advent, like the whole season of Lent, God has to remind us to be joyful. You know, there's two times a year where we as priests get to wear rose. Gaudate Sunday, halfway through Advent, and Laetare Sunday, halfway through Lent. To remind us that you know what? You're halfway there. You're almost there. Keep working. Put forth more effort, and the payoff will be worth it in the end. In fact, last Wednesday when I was in Alva talking with some of my brother priests, we, we had the age-old conversation, when is too early to set up your Christmas tree? Because I was always told, you have to wait until after Thanksgiving. And so when I go to Walmart on the Feast of All Saints Day, November 1st, and Christmas is everywhere, and drive there and see all the Christmas decorations already set up in Elk City, I'm a bah humbug for that first month. I say, you couldn't even wait till Thanksgiving? Come on! Why are you trying to go so fast? Why aren't we patient? Because we as Americans, we as humans aren't patient. We, we are a hurry up and wait type of person. And so I, I become grumpy every year in November. So it's kind of nice that I'm not here in November so you guys don't see the grumpiness every year. Katie has to see it because she works with me. Sorry. But beyond that, most of you guys don't see my grumpy, grumpiness except for sometimes it comes out in homilies. And then we finally get to Advent, where it's like, ah, finally, we can prepare. And my family, typically, again, on Black Fridays, typically we put the Christmas tree up, but you know what? I didn't this year. Because
because they did it in Florida and I was on my way back here. So we had that conversation last Wednesday of, when do you put up your Christmas tree? And do you know there's actually a day you're supposed to start doing it? I did not know this until last week. Do you know what day you're supposed to officially start putting your Christmas tree up? Today, on Gaudate Sunday, where the season changes and prepares us in a very real way for the presence of the Lord. And so I, I'm doing good, because my Christmas tree's just sitting in my garage. <laughs> Hasn't been put, been put up yet. Probably will not get put up this evening either. I'm going to be completely honest. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow. Or I'll have Katie and Amy come do it sometime this week. Yeah, we've got to be realistic. I mean, I mean yeah, that's just kind of going to happen. Because for some reason in life, it's so easy to have the joy sucked out of our lives. It's so hard for us to hear the word joy and to realize that that's a gift given to us by God. That the way that we know we are a joyful person is because we have peace in our hearts and in our lives. But when we don't have peace, what God is really telling us is we are also lacking the virtue of joy. So that's something I've been praying with a lot in the last few years is how can I find more joy in life? How can I find more happiness in life? Because many times we equate one with the other. Well, you can be a joyful person and not be happy, and you can be a happy person and not be filled with joy, but you can't be a happy or a joyful person and not truly be filled with the gift of peace. And so how then do we go about finding this peace? Where do we look for it? Do we look for it in our football team winning a game? (laughs) Not if you're an Oklahoman. Do you look at it in our basketball team winning a game? Not for the last two years as a Thunder fan. Do you look at it as your baseball team? Well, if you guys are Rangers fans, then yes. But if you're a Dodgers fan like me, then no. Although we just did just show Hi Otani, Otani, whatever his name is. But that's going to give us momentary peace. That's going to give us that little excitement. And that's about it. But to truly find that joy, we have to look to scriptures. What did we hear in our second reading today? From St. Paul to the Thessalonians. In all circumstances, give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the Spirit. Think about that. We're called to not quench the Spirit. What does it mean to quench the Spirit? It means to stifle it. That's sometimes why the joy, the innocentness of our childhood stays in our childhood. Because it's quenched, it's quelched by some sort of outside force, whether it be a bully at school or a teacher that says that we don't know any better or, 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 or someone that just stifles our ability to truly be who God has called us to be, we are quenching the Spirit. We are sucking it out of the gift of life. But we know 2,000 years ago, through St. Paul, he recognized this and says, don't do that. Do not despise prophetic utterances. Test everything. Retain what is good. Refrain from every kind of evil. We see this in our modern literature as well. One of the best writers in the 20th century for Christian liturgy, most people just kind of throw away. And I'm not talking about J.R.R. Tolkien. I'm talking about C.S. Lewis. How many of you guys have read C.S. Lewis before? Many of us have at least heard the name C.S. Lewis, or even easier, who's heard of the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe? That's probably where we know C.S. Lewis from. But even more than that, when he was talking about his own struggle with God, he wrote something called Mere Christianity. And in Mere Christianity, he looks at the person of Jesus Christ. And he says, when we authentically look at the person of Jesus We can truly only put him into one of three categories. He's either a liar, he made it all up. He's a lunatic, he's just off his rocker. Or he's the Lord. Those are really the only three categories we can put the Lord into. If he's a liar, he made it up, it wouldn't sustain. If he's a lunatic, well, there's been plenty of those throughout history. And they don't continue on. 
So he then goes a step further and says, so I believe then he is the Lord. And if Jesus Christ truly is the Lord, how does he call us to live? What does he call us to do? And why are we so stubborn in listening to what it is he's calling us to do? In his final book in the series of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, The Final Battle, he talks about anything that is good comes from Aslan, the Christ figure. That even if you don't know him by that name, anything that is good comes from Aslan, comes from Jesus Christ, comes to us from God. St. Paul, 2,000 years ago, says, test everything. Retain what is good. Refrain from every kind of of evil. So what C.S. Lewis was trying to say in the last century, take what is good, dismiss what is evil. Yet many times in our lives, we don't dismiss what is evil, we tend to yearn for it. We tend to surround ourselves many times not with something that will help us grow, but instead with people that agree with us. But you know where there's no growth? In a vacuum. And when you have people in your circle that are always going to tell you yes and always agree with you, rarely will you find growth in virtue. That's why from the time I was joining seminary until now, I've always said, I don't want a yes person working for me. I want you to tell me no. Nicely, respectfully, charitably, don't call me a moron because nobody likes that. Defenses go up. <laughs> Sometimes I am, I get it. But how do we help each other grow? If we say, you know what, you've got kind of a growing edge. How can I help you in that? Is that saying, you're being dumb, don't do that. Okay, well, how do I change? How do we grow? How do we help each other to learn? We have to do it with a joyful heart. All of the things that St. Paul was talking about in that second reading to the Thessalonians today was all about how we can find peace. May the God of peace make you perfectly holy, and may your, you entirely, spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I'm not blameless. I'm a sinner. And because of my sins for such a long time, I've defined myself by those sins, and I define others by their sins as well. I think that's one of our struggles. When we begin to recognize that we are a sinner, and begin to recognize others as sinners as well, that joy goes deeper into our hearts. It doesn't become the wellspring anymore, but then becomes something that we have to look for, something we have to excavate from our lives. And that's what the seasons of Advent and Lent, of penance and patience and preparations, patience and preparation are for. To help us uncover what's getting in the way. First and foremost, our sins. If we are holding on to sin, or sin is keeping us bound, it's not only difficult, but it's darn near impossible to be a joyful person. Because we aren't identifying ourselves by God, but we're identifying ourselves by evil. Because sin is evil. We aren't holding on to the good. We aren't embracing the good. We aren't even looking for the good many times because many times we have such corrosion in our hearts that the only way that we can feel like we belong in a community is to find the corrosion in everyone else's hearts as well. Gossip, envy, jealousy, pride. All of those come from the same lack of discipline in the virtues of joy and peace and love. And so God's giving us an opportunity today for this next week, because Christmas is a week from Monday, to find joy in the world. And where we can't find joy in the world, to be a joy-filled person in the world. 
But that means recognizing that we can't do it by ourselves. Recognizing that with God, truly all things are possible. It means instead of allowing grumpy to be your spirit animal and being a bah humbug, instead looking to happy. Even dopey would be okay of the seven dwarfs. And finding some way to engage the world in a loving manner. Challenge it, yes. But to do so out of love. To turn away from those evil things and to embrace what is good. So my brothers and sisters, God is giving us every opportunity that we will ever need to find joy, to be joy, to live joyfully. May we wait no longer. May we embrace it and intentionally not allow the joy to live live down deep in our hearts, but to live in our faces, in our actions, and in every word that comes from our mouths.